Hi, I'm Ted Wolf, presented by Guidewise. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, where we connect you to the stories and insights of people who have mastered implementation. Why? Because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Join us as we uncover the secrets of successful implementation so you can conquer your implementation struggles. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, sponsored by Guidewise, where we focus on the topic of implementation. Because ideas are easy, implementation is hard. Today, my guest is Stuart Morris. Stuart is an individual that has a quite extensive background. He is an entrepreneur. He's a tech inventor. He's a TEDx speaker. And uh, he also um, lays claim to having one of his startups um, basically hit the five billion dollar revenue mark on the new york stock exchange he also has a forthcoming book coming out called one once in a one in a million life and we'll talk about that in some detail i'd like to welcome Stuart to today's podcast thank you very much it's a privilege to be here thank you Stuart. um in the information that i've read on yourself um you mentioned that you have neurodivergency could you explain for our listeners, what neurodivergent might mean? I think it's, it's, it's in one sense really easy and another sense really difficult. So in all of human behavior, there is a spectrum. There are a few people way out at the edges and most people are kind of in the average in the middle, a little bit this way, a little bit that way. But there are distinct ways in which the human brain can begin to behave differently. So relatively well understood things like dyslexia where a child might be late to learning to to read and write uh, and in my case it was at the age of eight i couldn't read and write so dyslexia big thing the corollary to that is uh, dyslexic people often are able to visualize quite complex uh, concepts in ways that people who aren't dyslexic uh, can't uh, i'm also adhd so the idea of just sitting down and reading a book from cover to cover is hell anyway. Um, so if you can't read and don't want to read because it's going to take you way too long, uh, that's going to be really difficult. Um, so ADHD, again, ADHD people tend to be very creative. They're interested in a lot of things. They need a constant um, a stimulation, constant new things going on. A downside there is that can lead to forms of addiction because the brain is seeking dopamine. ADHD, the brain is not processing dopamine well, and so they need that stimulation to to get more dopamine, just to feel like most people feel all the time. And that's why you can end up with some forms of addictive behaviors going on with ADHD people. And then there's autism laid on top of that, which in a way, weirdly, is kind of head to head with ADHD. Autistic people tend to have uh, one or two very, very deep focused subjects that they're really interested in. They just want to dive right in there and, and spend all their time and energy on that. Uh, for me, it's, it's really clear. It's aviation. If you get me talking about airplanes, two hours later, you are asleep and I'm still in heaven talking about airplanes. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that and the ADHD can can compete in different ways, but uh, especially with autism, it's very difficult to characterize because it can express in a number of different ways. And so once you've met one autistic person and learned how they work, you've met one autistic person and another autistic person. The brain may have similarities, but the way they process it and the way they're living in the world may be may be very, very different. So you will find autistic people, you're know, definitely at the extreme end. They have to struggle engaging in in community uh, activities because they just need to be really, really focused. Uh, so for me, a really good example of that is if I'm going through an airport, there's just too much noise, too much light, too much sound, too much going on. So I will have a pair of solid titanium earplugs in just so I can bring all of that overstimulation down and cope with it. So there you go. That was a really fast introduction to the three major um, neurodivergencies, which all exist here. Mm -hmm. Well, what I would say is I think you just described the entrepreneur mindset very well in many ways, because 
they definitely are compulsive and they stick to an idea, but that idea can be forgotten pretty quickly. Um, if you could explain, um, do you process then information and um, experiences in a business, even in the emotional realm, a little differently? Oh, definitely. So a lot of autistic people um, have a thing called alexithymia, which is where they don't feel emotions uh, potentially at all until they become totally overwhelming. Or if they are feeling an emotion, they may not be able to give it a name. They may not be able to say, I fear, fear, I feel fearful, or I feel excited. They may just feel something mm -hmm. um, and they're unable to distinguish it. And so certainly in, in you know, running the business, you know, am I able to process what my colleagues and employees are, are feeling? Am I able to see the subtlety of, of what's going on? Actually, really good examples of this. Uh, Steve Jobs, um, Elon Musk, yeah, it's quite evident that they have no real uh, connection with what with the emotions of what's going on around them. Or Steve Jobs mm -hmm. in the past tense, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so when you are faced with a particularly, I'm going to say emotional decision. You have to lay people off. You're going to affect yeah. their life, their career, things like that. How would you process that almost fear and anxiety? Um, it is interesting. I think in many ways, you know, I've had to do that. I had a business where we had to lay off um, 14 members of staff. It was just coming up to Christmas. We'd run out of cash. You know, it, it was it was uh, in the middle of a, a financial crisis. And, you know, I knew these people, I knew their spouses, their children went to school with my kids. It wasn't just laying off random people. It was laying off people that, you know, I'd actually, mm -hmm. actually knew really well. I think one of the things that, yes, you feel that fear, you've, but you know that it's the only thing that you can do, that, that not doing it isn't an option. And so in a way you're able to detach from the emotion, you still feel it, you, you might, it'll probably come out physically in some way, your body will rebel, uh, but actually in the moment you can just go into, this is what has to be done, this is the way it must be done, there is no alternative which can be a good thing or it can also be a bad thing because it may be that they, what you see as there can be no alternative. It's just a, an example of rigid thinking where your brain is going, this is the only way, but actually there might be another way that I don't see. And that's why a, a really powerful thing to do is to have a, not necessarily a business partner, but somebody else you can talk things through with who might be able to say, ah, oh, had you thought about this or that, rather than just plowing on regardless with the only way you can see to do it. Mm -hmm. So when you first realized that you had dyslexia or ADHD, what was that experience like? Um, it was really freeing for me. It was like, oh, this is why the world doesn't make sense. This is why this has always been hard. Ra rather than, so, so I used to beat myself up the whole time going, why can't I do this? Why can't I just sit down at my desk and work for eight hours straight like my colleagues appear to be able to do, you know, and there must be something wrong with me. Uh, and then when I got the diagnosis, um, so I was diagnosed uh, dyslexic when, in my mid forties. Uh, and then the autism was two years ago, it, you know, early mid fifties and the ADHD was last year. Um, you know, I'm 56 now. And it was like, Oh, relief. I now understand why the world doesn't make sense there are ways I can learn how to make it make sense. Or the, the, like putting the earplugs in when I'm going through an airport just massively reduces the stress of going through the airport. Just little things that enable me to cope with the world as it is, rather than thinking that it's me that's completely screwed up. Um, but also to, right, where are the superpowers? Where are the things that come from this that nobody else can do? Where, what are the things that enable me to do something to, to that hyper focus that comes with the autism and just sit there totally working on it, fix something, get up, run around the building because that's the ADHD kicking off and then have another idea and another idea and another idea, go back in and then plow until the problem is solved or the invention is invented. 
So actually, what a lot of people end up doing before diagnosis is is beating themselves up for not fitting in. And then post-diagnosis, like, hey, I'm free. I know who I am now. Let me relish the pluses that mm -hmm. that has and manage the minuses. So let's just say that you have an employee and um, it's not known or recognized or declared that they have been, they think differently. Um, yeah. How would you manage them and how does that affect the whole IQ, EQ arrangement? Because everybody today is saying emotional intelligence, it's important, that's more important than IQ in many respects. How does that affect somebody with the dyslexia or ADHD? So what you'll often find is dyslexia is, is a very specific thing. It's to do with reading and writing, but they may be incredibly intelligent in other ways. Um, they may have mathematical abilities that are off the scale. Um, weirdly, because it's to do with reading and writing, they may well be genius with spreadsheets or with computer programming. Again, autistic people, an awful lot of uh, programmers are autistic because um, the, the interaction with the computer is is unemotional. It's I tell it to do this and it does it. And if I get the code wrong, it does it wrong. It, 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 you're not trying to second guess what the human being is thinking. I think the thing as a leader is that understanding that I don't necessarily understand people's emotions immediately doesn't mean I can't ask them what they're feeling. It just means I didn't spot the facial expression that gave the clue that they were upset today. Um, just today, I had an example of a member of staff who's been acting a bit strangely for a couple of days. And you know, other members of staff were going, what's going on with this person? You know, just, just banging heads. And you realize there's an issue at home. Okay, well, how can we help release the pressure a little bit so the issue at home becomes less of a stress at work? But actually, if you're spotting patterns like that, that there's somebody who is struggling with a particular um, task or a particular way of working, a really classic one for autistic people is if you've got an open plan office and uh, somebody is sort of struggling, not being productive, well, that may be just because their senses are wildly overloaded. What about suggesting that they put music on or, or even just white noise or whatever they want in headphones and close the rest of the world out so they can just focus on what they're trying to do? They may not realize that that's what's going on, but if they're having to tr having trouble being productive in an open plan office, then that might be a solution. The converse to that is if you've got an ADHD person who's in an office on their own, they may well be having productivity issues because they're, they're not getting stimulated enough. They need the, the banter, the conversations, the ideas that are bouncing off the walls in an open plan area. You know, it's, it's, Mm -hmm. Being deliberate, being intentional about understanding who your employees are and, and the environment in which they are going to thrive, and and whether you've got the ability to sort of subconsciously work out what somebody's feeling or not, you can ask. You can always consciously try and work out how they're behaving, how they're feeling, what they need in order to be more productive. And a big part of that is the sense of belonging. If your employees don't feel like they belong, if they don't believe in the mission of the business, it doesn't matter what you pay them, they're going to leave. Right. So in your experience, um, which is extremely valuable, most, I'll say, business owners or leaders and managers in business of any size may not have this in the forefront of their mind. And they're looking at their employees and saying, this person can't focus. We can't get them to work. They, they're not meeting their deadlines, whatever it is. How do we get that in the forefront of someone's mind to evaluate their workforce from the standpoint of saying, um, when you look at mental health, what is mental health? But how do we help individuals excel in the environment? And how do we help make that environment? Some people, I'm afraid, wouldn't even think of that or consider that. Uh, and And... To be brutally honest, some employees will never respond. There are people out there who either can't or won't work. You know, let, let's face, mm -hmm. face facts. At some point, you need to let somebody go. But actually, there's an awful lot you can do before that. And I think one of the things that I've always done with my team leaders and managers is 
you can be promoted when your team can do what they need to do without you. So rather than what tended to happen, and, and this is kind of an old way of thinking, 80s, 90s, 2000s thinking, was I need to be the expert so they don't fire me because they need what's in my brain. Actually, I turned that on its head, and this was one of the reasons why we were so successful with the software development business. We were saying to the team leaders, look, get everything that's in your head into your team so they can do what they need to do without you, then I can promote you. And very quickly, people realize, ah, oh, it is in my interests to be interested in my team, to develop my team, to make my team more productive. And so the passing of skills down, you know, be model the behavior you're trying to get people to do, be interested in them upskill them, spend time developing them, and encourage them to do the same for their direct reports. And, and you know, if you've got multiple layers in the business, so on down. Again, it's showing interest in people. I think a really good example of this, and, and I've used this example um, in, a, in different ways on, on uh, in other environments, Boeing. Boeing used to be all about the engineering all about the engineering. We build outstanding aircraft. They are efficient to fly. They're comfortable for the passengers. They are safe. That was Boeing's mantra. And the senior management were in offices in Seattle. And if there was an engineering problem, they knew about it. And then a few years ago, they moved the C-suite across to Chicago, and they completely disconnected the senior management from the production of the airplanes. And actually, it was a stage further. They then outsourced the production of a large proportion of the parts of the aircraft to, to external businesses. And so the focus went from outstanding quality and, and this Boeing family. We build outstanding aircraft together to, well, the C-suite in Chicago, and they're focused on their pension funds and their um, bonus packages, which were all related to the short-term stock market price of Boeing shares, completely separate from the guy who's actually sitting there drilling holes in an aircraft fuselage and then bolting a door plug on. And I think there is a direct correlation between that disconnect between senior management and the guys building the airplanes that has led to the problem that Boeing have been, have been having recently with software, with hardware, with engineering, all the way through. If you I'm not saying the, C the, the CEO should know how to bolt a wing onto an airplane. No, they shouldn't know. But their interests should be aligned with that of the customer and with the, that of the employees, not purely in something that's divorced from the, the core of the business, like the stock price. So let's just say then that um, you know a lot of changes went on at Boeing, obviously, not all of them for the best interests of all concerned, we'll say. Yeah, managing change can be very difficult. So when we overlay that now with the different way people's minds work, the way they perceive process information, react information, emotions, and things like that, what have you learned to be some of the best ways to manage change within an organization? The biggest thing, regardless of whether people are neurodiverse or not, is fear. Change creates fear. Am I, am I still going to have a job? Am I still going to enjoy my job? Um, am I going to have to take a pay cut? Are the, all of these things, it, it's all about fear. And if you can communicate why we're changing, what's changing, how it's changing, who is involved in that change, clearly, honestly, and early, then you can reduce the amount of fear. And if you've reduced the amount of fear, you are more likely to get buy-in. You're more likely to get people going, oh, we can see why this is happening. It's going to improve my working conditions. I get a more interesting job out of it. Or maybe that there isn't you know, much going to change for that individual, but we're changing the structure of the company. But they will still have fear. They still, you know, that they're an employee, not an entrepreneur, because they don't want to be running their own business for the most part. I love being an entrepreneur. I love running my own businesses because the only person who can fire me is me. So you know, that that's a, a an appetite for risk that, that most people simply don't have. Most people go to work, collect the paycheck, go home. If you 
inject fear into that environment because you're talking about change without explaining it, then they may well go find a job elsewhere and they take their expertise with them and you lose that expertise. So it's about communication. Communication is absolutely key early and clearly. Correct me um, and help me understand a little then what you are communicating seems to be you're reframing, if I can use that term, you're reframing their ideas and beliefs about the change that's about to happen. You're making yeah. it a little bit more personal from an emotional standpoint and you're showing them an end result of why we're doing it. Here's why it's going to benefit everybody. And it's got to a benefit. Why do you them. think it, we, can, we can't mm -hmm. be saying because the company will be more efficient because they don't necessarily, and for the most part, most employees, certainly in mid-size up businesses, don't care about the company. That they're not invested in the company personally, you know, not literally as in shares, but you know, in terms of emotional investment, it's just a job. If you can show them why this change is going to benefit them personally, then you'll have buy-in. Okay. And with the advent now of new technology it introduces more change. And if you can't get people to change, you cannot implement ERP systems and new technologies and things like that. So being able to guide their emotions and their ideas, opinions, beliefs is really, really important to communicate the meaning of the change. Now we have a whole new technology called artificial intelligence we're bringing into basically change and revamp many, many white collar type of jobs for the first time. In your experience, what do you suggest as how to manage that? Because there's going to be a lot of people put out of work, I might say, but the worst case scenario, I think, and they I have think to that's going to be the case for a while. And I think by the time it is the case, new jobs will have been created. So what we're seeing at the moment with chat GPT and things, you know, you, you can, well, you see it now, you put a Google search in and Google comes up with a generative answer to your question that, that is an AI generated answer to your question. Hmm. So, you know, somebody might say, create me 500 words of marketing copy for, uh, at this new product and chat GPT will produce something, but what it has produced isn't usable as it stands. It needs a human being to apply emotion, to, to fact check it for a start, because an awful lot of stuff that comes out of these things is just wrong um, and, and often repetitive. So there's all sorts of problems that come out of using AI without thought. At the moment, we still have to think about it. So in a sense, the, the marketing executive can become much more productive because they can get chat GPT to produce a whole load of stuff for them, but it still needs somebody with an expert eye to go over it and go, actually, how do we make this go from good to great? Because a lot of these AI tools are, cho are producing good, but they're not producing great. Or if there's, you know, create me an image of whatever it is, you know, I saw a load during the, um, the European Cup football recently where people were producing AI images of lions with with um, English flags in their manes. But one of the lions has five legs or you know, all, all of this kind of thing where the, the generative stuff is producing things that have got weirdnesses going on. So we still need human beings to take that generative output and turn it into something that is really spectacular. Over time, obviously, these things will get better. But at the moment, remember, none of the AI we have generated, we have built so far, actually understands what it is generating. It doesn't have a conceptual understanding of the text it's created. All it's got is a, well, if you're talking about this subject, these are phrases that appear in the body of text that I was given to learn on. It doesn't understand how those body those sentences actually interrelate. If when we get to a point where AI does actually understand those things, then we have a problem. But right now, it it still needs a human being because we are the only thing on the planet that actually can understand what's what it's looking at. I agree with that, and I think there's tremendous opportunities for business and individuals using it because. 
it's going to be an aid that helps you become much more intelligent. And I think, um, as you had mentioned previously, um, sometimes we all need somebody to talk to, confide in, give us feedback. That's the strength of it. It's just going to be like another member of the team who has a particular intelligence in some area. And I think it's a long way to be able to um, refine that, but things move pretty quickly today. They do. They do. And, it, and AI will help with that because it'll be developing itself. But still, even the way it's moving, it does not actually understand what it's doing. Right. So I agree. So let's say I, AI comes in or the, the constant change and disruption that business is working in and living today. The pace is only going to get probably more intense. The changes will be more, have more ramifications to them. Um, it's probably going to make people second think their life. Let's say that they get to midlife. They're in that great middle of a business, the middle management level. They have to reconsider where are we going to go? What am I going to do? Am I going to be in the old days? They called it outsourced, downsized, many other things. How do, where do I take my life from here? What's your recommendation on how they think about that particular very fearful event that may happen in their life? The answer for me has always been take control. If you're feeling directionless, if you're feeling out of control or that other people are in control, take control. And for me, that for the last 30 years has been run my own business. And that's meant success at times. It's meant failure at times. You're at, I've, I've had businesses that have failed catastrophically, but I have been the captain of the ship. I've had the decision right at which point do we give up on this project and say, this isn't working? At which point do we f pivot and go and do something else? And so I know that entrepreneurship isn't for everybody. I know that there are an awful lot of courses out there that people are saying, you know, we'll all have seen these adverts. Uh, you know, buy my course, I'll teach you how to be a coach. You know, you can make all of this money coaching businesses. Well, the reality is that person makes more money out of coaching coaches than they do out of actually doing the coaching. You know, they're making their money selling you a course. They're not making their money doing the thing. And the other thing about businesses like that, you know, eBay arbitrage, Amazon drop shipping, coaching of, of various kinds, it's all about you, the individual. If you want to take a month off and go and do whatever, the business will stop without you. So you end up building, you're building a business of one. It's you. It, everything is revolving around you. If what you want is time freedom, cash freedom, the freedom to be able to be in command of your own ship, you need to build a business that is real, as I call it, you know, not just drop shipping stuff mm -hmm. through Amazon, but actually where you have a team of staff who, if you decide to take a month off, they will run the business because you've taught them how to run the business and, and you can do that. And, and so for me, you know, I have a, I have a lifelong goal. I want to fly my vintage airplane across the Atlantic. So the, the aim is to uh, do this, um, I hope, next year. It's, you know, so there's a lot of hurdles to get there, but that will require me to take probably six weeks out of the business where I'm unlikely to be able to respond to emails and phone calls in anything close to real time, certainly for 10 days of that when I'm flying the, the west, you know, up from the UK up to Iceland, Greenland, and down into uh, Newfoundland and down into the States. I am not going to be contactable anything like real time. So the team have got to be able to run the business without me, potentially for two weeks on that leg. I then want to go flying around the US and visit friends and family and you know, fly, to, fly over the Grand Canyon, fly over Manhattan in my small airplane, you know, do sightseeing stuff. And I don't want to be answering. I want to get back to a hotel at night and go, right, I've now got three hours of emails to answer. So... The goal for me is to build the business to a point where it runs itself. And then I have the control and freedom to do whatever on earth it is I want to do. And a lot of the time, that's 
be part of the business. I love working in my businesses. It, you know, it, we've just finished teaching a course here. We've had 17 students, two trainers plus me in a classroom for us uh, since Sunday. It's now Friday. So we've had five whole days of full time teaching, exercises, moving around, doing stuff. Absolutely love it. It's, it's terrific fun. I also have a hospitality business. That's where I am. This wall behind me is 300 years old. So I'm running a retreat center in a 300 year old farmhouse, 20 bedrooms. There is, there's a problem a day. You know, the roof leaking, whatever it is. It's an old building. It needs those things. We have catering. We have you know, staff that need to feed the guests who are on the training course. So I'm, I'm getting this at from both ends. Absolutely energized all week. And here I am, you know, it's what? nine o'clock on a Friday evening, as far as I'm concerned here in the UK, and I'm doing a podcast and you can see the energy level. You know, it's, I'm still pumped because I get to do most days the thing I love doing and then talking about it, even more heaven. So the one in a million life is uh, the book and the course is basically take control, be intentional. Don't just drift through your days and, and hope that life will come out. It won't. Decide what it is you want to do, put the steps in place to get there. And, and I've got a program that kind of works you through to minimize the risk. Uh, so I've never, I've had businesses go bust, but I've never lost the house. You know, I've always ensured that my spouse and my children uh, have had a roof over their heads. I've been able to do that because I've managed the risk uh, to do those things. So it, there are ways of doing it. It takes discipline. It takes hard work. There is no easy way to time and financial wealth. There, there just isn't. It, anybody who tells you there is, is is blowing smoke in places there shouldn't be smoke. If if winning the lottery is your strategy for a retirement, you, you, you're screwed. Pardon the French. It ain't going to work. So yeah, it's about an intentional deliberate process with lots of checks and balances. We try this, we test it. Did it work? Yes, no. Yes. Okay. No. Okay. What do we need to change? Iterate, 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 iterate. Failure is part of being an entrepreneur. Nobody can take that away, but it is the place where the learning happens. And you know, one of the things that, that everybody forgets is that Steve Jobs got kicked out of Apple. You know, he created a whole new computer company called Next. He spent millions and millions of dollars building the Next Cube, and it went absolutely nowhere. He had phenomenal failure. But out of that came the computer that we now know as the Mac. So failure is part of progress. What we have to do is learn how to fail quickly, fail cheaply, and fail without making your partner, your wife, your husband, whoever it is you spend your time with and your children homeless. And there are ways of doing that. It's just fail quickly, fail cheap, and do it intelligently. So tell us a little bit more, if you could, about the course and the book. What mm -hmm. are the topics and what are some of the um, teachings that you offer in that course? So risk risk is a really important thing. So a lot of people are very afraid of entrepreneurial risk. They perceive entrepreneurs to be insane risk takers. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the guys that jump off mountains wearing squirrel suits, you know, the, the base jump um, guys, that they take insane risks. Um, when you think about risk, one of the first things you think about is, is affordable loss. Rather than betting the house, bet something that you can afford. If you're taking your family to the, the movies tonight to see the latest blockbuster movie, you have decided you're going to spend a certain amount of money. There's transport, there's the tickets, there's the popcorn, the hot dogs, the nachos, the drinks, all of those things. You know, a family of five, you might be looking at you know, the thick end of 100, 150 bucks to go out and watch this movie. So you've decided you're going to spend that chunk of change and you're taking the family to the movie. There is a risk. The movie could be awful. 
In which case, you're coming home and the kids are in the car going, Dad, why did you take us to this movie? Yeah, it was awful. You've lost 150 bucks. But that was affordable. You, you took the decision that you were going to try and do that tonight. Um, I had I have a friend who, he's a professional gambler, not an addicted gambler. That's a very different thing. He's a professional gambler. He will go to Vegas with $10,000 check into a hotel, put $10,000 behind the counter, turn it into chips, and go play blackjack for a week. Now, he's prepared to risk the $10,000 because that's his vacation. That's what he's, he's going to get, $10,000 worth of fun playing blackjack for a week, eating in nice restaurants, staying in a nice hotel. He hopes that he can play blackjack well enough that he'll come home with a profit even, or certainly not a $10,000 loss. But the reality is he's prepared to risk that and can afford to risk that and will have that much fun. So you know, affordable loss is a really important concept in terms of managing risk. Don't bet everything, bet what you can afford to lose and work like stink in order to not lose it. Also, Work with what you know. You know if, if you are an expert within your corporate environment in and whatever is you know, making widgets, then actually, if you understand the widget industry really, really well, probably your first business should have something to do with that widget industry. You will know gaps inside that industry where there's a product that somebody needs or a service that somebody needs. And so use what you know, use what you have, use your expertise, use your contacts, leverage what you already have. These things are the things that I'm working people through. They're, they're obvious, except most of us haven't thought of them. Um, and they're putting it into an iterative process. An awful lot of people say, building your business, you do A, you do B, you do C, you do D, and out the far end, you've got a million dollars. No. It's an iterative process. You go back and forth and round and round and round. You test, you implement, you change, you test, you implement, you change, you test, you implement, you change. And that, I believe, is what's different about my program. It's built in that you keep doing this iterative process, iterative improvement, risk a little, build a little, test a little, change a little. And then over time, the little becomes a lot because you've built up the expertise the cash basis that, that enables you to afford more. So it's a really so, structured program. So I go on. So that's okay. So when you go through your courses and the teaching and, and working with individuals, what have you found works best when it comes to the iterative process of being successful? Because you are going to have more losses than you have wins. That's just the art of continuous improvement. From an emotional standpoint, how have you learned to deal with those iterative failures? So they become, I'm going to say, catalysts for new behaviors, new insights. That's where innovation comes from. If everything's working well, there's little innovation that takes place. How do yeah. you guide people emotionally through that process? I think the other thing, especially when you've got a team of people working for you, is failure is not personal. Occasionally it is. You know, I had a situation this week where the kitchen messed up. Uh, an individual was given a, uh, a meal containing gluten. They were gluten intolerant. We had a situation. We know exactly who messed up. We know exactly when they messed up. We know exactly how they messed up. That individual was in tears. They realized they, they'd screwed up. They absolutely knew this was on them. Now, I could fire them. I would have been perfectly within, you know, nobody, the HR department would not have shouted at me if I'd gone, this guy gone this afternoon. But actually, fortunately, the, the, the customer did not suffer, um, too badly. The situation was caught before they, before they tucked in. Retraining. I now have intense loyalty from that individual. The whole of the catering team now understand the importance of the processes that we have 
in place to ensure that this kind of thing doesn't happen because they've all watched it fail because somebody didn't do their job properly. So it becomes, it becomes a teaching opportunity. So that individual, you know, I failed. No, no, no. We failed because the process wasn't robust enough. How can we change the process to mean you don't have to fail? Um, it, that an in, that there isn't a single point of failure that an individual can't screw it up. And so actually what I now have is a very loyal member of staff who still has a job, who's well motivated to stay and well motivated to work his backside off because he knows he owes me. But also I have a whole team of people who are going, actually, if I do screw up by accident, there is grace. There is understanding. There may be a price to pay. There's a price to pay for freedom just as much as there's a price to pay for slavery. It's just different. Um, and so by making failure not personal, by making it right, what can we learn? How did I fail? What did I not teach that individual in order to help them get it right? By making it not personal, we, we take the fear away. And when we take fear of judgment away, we enable people to say, actually, how about if we do it like this? You know, we, I, we engage their imagination. We engage their creativity. We engage their ability to go, actually, if we reorganize the kitchen a little bit like this, it would really help with that process. Um, and so you know, what happened within a day was that they changed several pieces of, of equipment to make it easier to manage the separate processes. So I'm, I'm using you know, current examples that are actually quite embarrassing to me because you know, when, when that particular guest came to pay their, uh, to settle up their bill at the end of the, the course, um, I w was talking to the, uh, the, the member of staff who was taking the credit card payments and I just put a line through this person's bar bill. It wasn't a huge amount of money. I'll swallow that. We, you know, we, we messed up. That person's experience could have been damaged. That person's health could have been damaged. Potentially, we could have had a massive lawsuit on our hands by taking, I think it's about 70 bucks worth of bar bill and saying, our problem, not yours. I've now turned that person's experience, you know, the gratitude that I got from this customer for fixing their bar bill for them was completely disproportionate. So what I'm taking away from your comments about managing the emotions of uh, iterative losses and things like that is exactly what you said earlier in this conversation, and that is take control. Take control, act, take people's best interests in heart, and make sure they're satisfied, safe, taken care of, but just take control and act. Don't freeze. Don't withdraw. Don't let fear overtake you. Um, get engaged in a positive manner and um, make the changes you need to make, which is excellent. So you have a lot of accomplishments behind you. You've built businesses. You've seen success, highs and lows. You've been involved in a lot of different endeavors. Where is Stuart going in the future? What do you see your future to be? I'm 56 years old and I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> um, for me, life is an adventure. Um, you know, I've, I've suffered physical injury, uh, which was life-threatening, you know, and I fought through that. Life is incredibly precious. And I think life is to be lived. You know, some people believe in a, in a life, in an afterlife. I very much believe that, that we should all be free to live uh, in this life before we get there, if there is a there. And so I don't tend to give myself big, grandiose goals. I don't imagine that I'll ever retire because I love building businesses. Um, I don't want to get to the point where I say, you know what, I'm 65 years old, let's go play golf. That would be hell on earth for me. Um, so I'm currently building up a hospitality business, uh, which you know, it seemed like a great idea to buy a failing hospitality business at the end of a global pandemic and the beginning of a cost of living crisis. Um, I like giving myself challenges. It's a challenge. 
Uh, I'm working on a new uh, product for the aviation industry. Uh, you know, that's my creative business coming out. My, my passion is aviation. So it's an industry that I know. I saw a problem. I'm working on that product. In a year's time, there'll be a, a new challenge. But one of the big things that I'm working on right now within my businesses is to be able to say, for one week a month, I am off grid. That's not that I'm taking vacation. I might be taking vacation. I might be working, but there is nothing in my diary and I will not be responding to emails or text messages in real time. I'm going to be off grid for one week a month so that I can engage my creativity for whatever I want to engage. And then next year, we're getting to the point where I am off grid for at least one month in the year. So what I'm trying to do is build into my diary this big chunk of time that is not constantly on the go so that I can let those, if I want to go play golf, I can do that. I know that the chances are that I won't. I'll be inventing something new. I'll be going and talking to somebody about some new opportunity, or you know, perhaps I'll be touring the States in my airplane doing speaking opportunities because got to pay for the fuel somehow. Well, I think you'll have a very interesting future and in, um, rest of your life. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Stuart, for your time. You have a wonderfully fascinating mind and way of looking at things, and you easily um, can bond with people. You can tell that. You enjoy life. That comes through very strong. So I would like to thank you for your time. We've learned an awful lot. I wish you every good fortune with your book, One in a Million Life, and the course that you're going to be teaching. And uh, I hope that you see that 300-year wall behind you for a long time because I think you have a lot of great experiences ahead of you. Love to stay in contact with you and look forward to future contact. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me. Ted Wolf here. I want to thank you for joining us for this Implementers video. The Implementers podcast is presented by Guidewise, where we, along with our vetted member community, recognize that ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. To learn more about getting things done with Guidewise, please visit us at guidewise.io. And to conquer your implementation struggles, please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. Happy implementing.